Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. It's a review for a single book. This is The New Life by Tom Crew. It's a historical fiction uh, set in the 1890s in London. A time of uh, ideas for sort of progressive uh, politics such as uh, socialism. Uh, we're only 10 years away from the suffragette movement being formed. Um, Freud's early ideas uh, which were very much biological rather than what they later came on to be. Um, so it's a sort of, you know, time of sort of fevered intellectual activity. And uh, this book uh, considers one aspect of that, which is the desire to change the law, which currently in the 1890s still saw male homosexuality as an illegal act that could um, be uh, punished by imprisonment. Uh, interestingly, um, lesbianism was not even recognised as a thing by the law, so it wasn't illegal. I mean, women wouldn't be uh, sent to prison simply because it just wasn't acknowledged that it could even exist. So this book um, is based on true historical fact, uh, which I didn't know at the time of reading. I only learned about it in the author's afterward, and the fact and the events that it's based on, I also wasn't aware of anyway. So very briefly, um, two men who never in fact met in life, but they still uh, collaborated on writing a book called Sexual Inversion, which was making the case uh, for homosexuality to be legalised. And it's, it sort of theoretically and intellectually took a, um, a sort of legal medical uh, thrust of their arguments. Uh, and then it also had case studies, which were anonymised, from uh, gay men uh, who talk about their sort of experiences of, of life and how everything had to be hidden and they had to be invisible. Many were married. Uh, there are also the difference between sort of uh, upper class uh, homosexual men and uh, working class homosexual men. Um, so that was the thrust of the real life book as well as the book that's at the heart of this story. The actual people who wrote that book were uh, J. Arthur Simons and uh, Havelock Ellis. And Havelock Ellis was uh, a medical man and Simons was a sort of uh, an intellectual. I don't know if he was actually an academic. Here, the two characters, John uh, Addington represents the, um, the Simons character. He's an academic. And uh, the other man represents the, 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 the medically trained, although he's not a practicing doctor, uh, corresponding to Havelock Ellis. Um, and in fact, the book came, that was first published in, in real life uh, in 1894, which was one year after Simons had already died. So that's the historical context. And this, this book uh, is very much using that as its, as its basis. And I was really looking forward to this book. I very rarely read historical fiction because, as I said in several videos, I studied history and um, I find that historical fiction is either good fiction but bad history or not very interesting fiction but technically probably quite accurate to the facts, in which case you may as well go and read a history book. And I'm going to touch back on that uh, when I talk about this book because... I was slightly disappointed in this book. I think it's a really important book because of the issues it deals with and raises. But as a piece of literature, I think it had some failings. I still gave it four stars. I still think it's, as I say, an absolutely worthwhile read. But for me, as a writer, I found myself questioning some of the decisions that the author of this book made. Anyway, so now to sort of go, go on, on to talk about this particular book, not the historical uh, fact that it was based on. So John Eddington, it starts off with a brilliantly described what is essentially a wet dream, although as you're reading it uh, you don't think, you don't appreciate it's a dream until literally the climax uh, when it's revealed as a dream. And what it is, is that he's he's talking about being on the relatively new London underground where he's sort of pressed in upon, you know, it's so crowded that he's pressed in upon, you know, by everyone around him, including this man, and increasingly uh, it gets more and more uh, erotic, let's put it that way. And it's it's brilliant. I, I mean, it's a fantastic opening to the novel. Um, he is married to a woman called Catherine. They have three daughters. 
and she knows that he's a homosexual um, but he has sort of been on the straight and narrow he's sort of repressed it for many many years but this dream is symptomatic that that he can't keep it under can't keep his passions under wraps uh, any longer and he meets uh, a working class man who's a printer uh, and they start having uh, an affair but again bear in mind they have to remain invisible uh, otherwise they, they risk facing prosecution the other man is also uh, married but he's not homosexual although people assume that he is what he is as close as probably is to asexual although he does have a kink that what turns him on although it happens very infrequently is when he hears women micturating uh, and then he has to bring himself off after that uh, but as I say, it happens so infrequently. And even though he marries, they live apart because his wife is a lesbian um, and they are both committed to each other because they like how each other's minds work and they are both sort of intellectuals, academics, or at least they're publishing and they sort of support each other in their writings. But they live apart. I mean, they do spend time together, mainly, as I say, when they're, they're writing and stuff. Um, and eventually uh, she moves in her, her lesbian lover and he's sort of slightly squeezed out even more of, from her life than previously. Anyway, these two men uh, correspond to each other because they like what they've written in the past and they, they decide they're going to collaborate on this book called Sexual Inversion. And as I say, they are looking to get the law changed by adopting a legal medical approach to the whole uh, concept of homosexuality in in Britain and they exchange obviously chapters and criticize each other's and edit each other's work as they go along and they produce this book and just as it's about to come out the Oscar Wilde trial break breaks and suddenly uh, the issue of homosexuality is absolutely in the public focus in the public sort of debates and discourse and that gives them pause for thought, you know. Wilde is prosecuted and found guilty of gross indecency and uh, corrupting morals. And obviously they have to sort of think about, well, what happens if, if we publish our book? Um, you know, could we also end up in court? Um, because what's happened, even though they've um, plumped for this sort of rather narrow... Um, thrust, as I say, of legal and medical, there is still a moral argument about equality at the heart of this. Um, so their, their arguments are that homosexuality is, you know, you're effectively you're born with it, or it's certainly a, uh, an inherent uh, thing. It's not a process of corruption, of sin, of falling from the pure, which is very much the, the sort of the, the, the line that society like to maintain based on sort of Christian morals and things like that. So there is inevitably a moral aspect of it, but the moral aspect here is countering notions of corruption and slippage from, you know, from the fall, um, and much more about sort of the nature of equality as a moral right, and as a moral fundamental. Um, they decide they're going to publish, but they know it's going to be restricted because it's going to be sort of really uh, sent to sort of the medical fraternity to, again, keep up this notion of this is a legal medical approach to homosexuality and why, why therefore, it should be legalised. Um, they find a publisher who will publish it uh, and they it gets published. However... What happens is, is that a bookseller who is operating out of his, his house uh, has sold a book to someone, to a young man in Liverpool. The parents discover this book, they complain, and basically the bookseller is going to be prosecuted. And again, that bears some relation to real facts. And I have to say, it's always typical that the bookseller is the one who gets uh, prosecuted first ahead of the writers and stuff. If you think of, um, you know, some of the... Uh, in America, in the, the, that campaign about sort of you know the the um, the nasty malign influence of hip hop and rap and and certain sort of so-called satanic heavy metal, uh, led by Tipper Gore under the Parents Music Resource Centre (PRMC), 
Uh, it was a record shop in Florida that first got prosecuted for um, selling uh, As Nasty As You Want To Be by, um, is it Two Live Crew? I think it was Two Live Crew. Um, so the, the the record store owner was the one who had up in court before Two Live Crew were prosecuted. And th this happens all the time. It's the poor old distributors of the material, not the people, not that you want anyone prosecuted, but rather the people who make the material. So this bookseller is going to be prosecuted and the two men say we will be behind you 100%, we will testify on your behalf at, because they see it, particularly John sees it as a chance to put across their case, to argue what the book argues. Uh, and they gain some supporters, but they realise that the supporters um, see this as a freedom of speech issue because it's a bookseller being prosecuted. They're not really interested in the homosexuality issue because, like so many people in the straight world, they are sort of they either don't want to think about you know what homosexuality entails, or it repulses them just as much. But that is out trump for them in their minds by the necessity of this being a freedom of uh, speech issue. So that is that is where. That is the sort of the outline of the plot. The problem I have with this is the characterization of the two men. Um, I think he's called Todd. I can't remember the name of, of, the, of the guy who's basically asexual. I think he's... Oh, Henry. That's right. Sorry, he's called Henry. Henry is a really difficult character to like because he's so... He's such an introvert. He's so easily cowed. He seems a man like, totally lacking in passion. As I say, he's, he's probably asexual to all intents and purposes. Um, so he's very much approaching this as out of sort of intellectual interest. You know, he's not a homosexual. He's not a directly affected. He knows he's different, but he's not a homosexual. He's not, you know, what he is married, even though he doesn't live with his wife. Uh, he and his wife think that that, revolutionary act itself is enough to inspire and to promote change for women and to have more rights and it doesn't it's 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 almost um, a symbolic gesture it's a, it's a token the other man john is a much more interesting character he is skirting and flirting with the boundary of of coming out of of being openly gay as much as the law will allow obviously the law will not allow him to be openly gay so he's still having to cover his tracks, the fact that he's moved his lover in and things like that. But all the time he's pushing, pushing, pushing because he wants to be able to be out openly. He has no shame of his homosexuality and nor should he. But society has very, very strong steps to prevent him from coming out. And the, the, the ultimate sanction being that of prosecution, which is what's going to happen to the book, the bookseller. But the interesting and the way he's written, and I think I think is an interesting and nuanced uh, way, is that other people get consumed in his lust to be able to be open and flagrant and promote homosexuality. Other people get swallowed up, including especially his wife, um, who he treats very badly. And I actually think Catherine, his wife, is written with great sympathy in this book. I mean, ultimately, uh, she has to make a decision about you know, the, the, what she's what what the status of their family is going to be if he exposes it in court that he's gay. Um, and as I say, I think she's written, you know, she she's put in an impossible position. And whether or not you agree with the decision that she takes, you could totally understand the pain and suffering that she's in and been put in and her daughters to a lesser extent. They're, they're a bit more open minded um, by John's actions. So John. On the one hand, you're cheering him because he wants to be able to fully express himself and, and be openly gay. But on the other hand, you're aware that in doing so, because of the way society and the law is structured, he's putting other people at harm and at, at jeopardy. But that brings me, as I say, to one of the problems I have with the book, is that because their argument is pseudoscientific, legal, medical... There's a real lack of passion in this book. Despite the opening, we never return to that passion. And again, it's this notion of, I said sort of their supporters either didn't want to know what gay men got up to or were repulsed by it. And I felt the book could have done with a bit more of it. And ironically, one of the books that um, Crow, is it Crow, Crew acknowledges is this. 
Who was that man by Neil Bartlett? I'm not sure whether you'd call this memoir, non-fiction, fiction. It doesn't matter. This is a brilliant book. It's one of my favourite books of all time. Neil Bartlett, uh, who was uh, a gay man in London in the 80s, and he's writing of uh, the gay experience of that time where homosexuality has almost been forced back in the closet by AIDS and the, you know, uh, anti-gay prejudice and gay bashing had never gone away, but it stepped up in the 80s because of AIDS. And Bartlett, this book is Bartlett's uh, communication uh, down back to the uh, 1880s and 90s of Oscar Wilde, of Oscar Wilde's London. And w one of the things it's so brilliant about is it talks about, you know, men who had to be uh, on the surface invisible as to their true sexuality, therefore had all sorts of codes, particularly in fashion, uh, to let other gay men know that they were gay so that they could, you know, find each other effectively. And I thought that's what this book was going to be. But the problem is, as I say, it's so sort of intellect... It's not intellectually written. It is written as a proper novel. But the thrust of the arguments being made in favour of homosexuality are uh, sort of intellectual and dry. They're, they're without passion. And both of these men are without passion. One is asexual and can't seem to feel any kind of erotic experience at all other than women micturating. The other... Although he is very reckless and passionate in how he wants to live his life, we don't get much of a sense of what that means on a day-to-day -day basis, whereas in this we do. Um, you know, the, his lover is, even though he lives with him, and, and we see many post-coital scenes where they're dressing and talking and all that sort of stuff, but the passion bits are sort of missed out glossed over and it's more about the intellectual drive and there is a very exploitative uh, relationship of aristocratic or well-off men and their working class partners who to some extent and and including John Ellington their passion is bought I'm not saying they're rent boys or prostitutes no absolutely not but it's explicit here where his partner sort of says you know you got me out of my cheap nasty lodgings I didn't have to work in the printer shop anymore you know, when I moved in with you. So there is, a, it, it makes it transactional. I'm not saying there isn't passion within that. There absolutely is. But it's not described in here, in, interestingly. Um, so I felt the book sort of fell down a bit on that. And the other way it fell, fell down is, it was, the plot was all. Everything was about advancement of the plot, really, to get to this situation of what would happen in the court case of the bookseller being prosecuted, what would Adlington's reactions be, what would Henry's reactions be. Um, and therefore it was character-led and plot-led, as most novels are. But I felt that took away from, again, the, the central burning importance of the subjects it was addressing because it was about plot resolution and sort of character resolution rather than the issues that the whole book had been written about. You know, you can go away and read the history of Havelock Evelis and J.A. Simons and the court case, all of that. You go read that and learn about it, or you can do it in here, or you can do both, obviously, read both. But here, because he's chosen to fictionalise, don't forget, um, Simons was dead before the court case, before the book was published. Here, you know, for poetic licence, the, the, the Simons character is very much alive and stuff. Um, but I ask why, what has been gained by fictionalising that version of, of history? Because in fictionalising it, the plot and the characters, or the personalities, become the highest priority because it's a work of literature. And I felt that takes away from if you'd read like a history version of it, where you would deduce, you know, this is a follow on from the Oscar Wilde thing. This is a very important landmark in terms of, um, you know, the, 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 the changing of attitudes, although, you know, suffragettes came, fir came first and secured their victory long before homosexuality did. Uh, in, 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 in the UK um, I just felt that somewhere, somehow the issues were very much on the down low and weren't brought up which sounds odd because it's clearly a book entirely devoted to that subject 
Um, so those those things sort of took the edge off it, as I say, that the sort of medico-legal approach, which somehow diminished the level of passion, which I think needed to be shown. Also, the fact that we didn't have the everyday lives, particularly the codes when they were out in public. Um, and as I say, the, you know, the fact this is a work of fiction and of literature, its artistry, I think also took away from the absolute red hot core of the issues it was it was talking about. So that's why I gave it four stars. As I say, it's an important book on a subject I knew nothing about. And again, I studied history at school and at university, but one of the things they never talk about are things like, you know, homosexuality in Victorian Britain. You never study it, which is why I was keen, you know, why that book speaks so much to me, because it absolutely supplements a gap in my, you know, quite well-educated history knowledge. And this didn't, even though I didn't know the events that, that the, the, that it was based on, which came very soon after the Wild case, and they're absolutely wrapped up with the Wild case, obviously. So there you have it. I'd be very interested to know if anyone's read it, what they felt about it. As I say, I would not discourage anyone from reading it at all. No, you know, as I say, I think it's it's still a good book. Just from, I think it could have been even better. I think is what I'm saying. Okay, uh, that's uh, that's it for this week. Thanks very much. Till next time.